with the basic gist of uh, this conference, I'm basically going to do a survey course as quickly as possible of a lot of things that government is engaged in. Um, and I could talk about any one of these things for the complete time that they've given me. So one thing I'll ask is if you're engaged and you want to hear more about what I'm talking about, give me like a little thumbs up uh, because, you know, we can dive deeper on any of these topics. Um, I'm Mina Zheng. I'm here from the White House. And I wanted to tell you about some of the things that the government is doing uh, in healthcare that affect all of the types of things that you guys are trying to accomplish here and also why you should care. So I know why you guys should care because two years and two weeks ago, this was home for me. I was one of you. I started my career building microfluidic uh, devices that were for cell sorting and identification for a startup company. I worked as a VC for several years and helped start several companies doing that. Um, and my job was to stay on top of what was happening in the world of healthcare. And two years and two weeks ago on a Wednesday, I got a phone call that said, can you start work on the phone helping to fix healthcare.gov and can you show up on Monday? And so began my adventure uh, in the stealth startup in the US government. Um, and I will say that prior to that work, I was always aware that the government was incredibly important in healthcare, was um, sometimes in my way in healthcare, was sometimes a risk factor in healthcare, um, but I didn't really understand how to engage in it, both personally and how companies like ours uh, could engage most effectively in it. So now I'm with the US Digital Service. Uh, I'll talk about it very briefly. Uh, it's, it was started to bring people like me, people like you, into the federal government. Um, we became aware through the catastrophe that was healthcare.gov um, that a lot of people yesterday talked about how software is eating the world, and that is absolutely true. The federal government is the biggest service delivery organization in the world. It is a humongous logistics organization. It is an infrastructure organization. Every service delivery organization is a technology organization, and they discovered that their limitation was their ability to manage technology. And so they started bringing in individuals to sit at the table very early on as policy decisions, as strategy decisions were being made uh, in order to help make sure that those would be enabled by technology and make the best use of technology as is possible, given what we currently have. So this is my team. Uh, obviously, we're very focused on being exponential. This is basically all of us, and uh, there are three million employees in the federal government. And what I want to talk very briefly uh, to you guys about is, number one, government as a platform. Um, government provides a lot of the things that we were talking about yesterday and that enable all of the work that you guys do. Number two, government modernization as an accelerant, and three, um, Sometimes government can even be the motivator for change and an accelerant uh, and can help move the market. So in keeping with the uh, purposes of this conference, um, what helps us move from curve to curve? This is something that I used to think about a lot when I was an engineer. It's something that I used to think about even more when I was a VC, or at least how do you choose something on the right curve? And we think about it a lot in government too. What can we do to take specific trajectories for, you know, the way healthcare costs are growing, the way technology development is moving, how, what policies can we use to help us jump from curve to curve? And what actually creates something that's exponential? So based on the survey, I, I chose some things that grow exponentially that will be relevant to each of you. One of them is the growth rate of the population of sheep in Ireland. Another one is how quickly mobile has taken off. And the thing that is in common between everything that grows very quickly, everything that grows exponentially, is number one, there has to be the motivation to grow. And that, you know, in the case of sheep is, as you know, natural desire. Um, and number two, you have to have sufficient inputs in order to allow it to grow quickly. So we see that the sheep eventually level off because you run out of inputs. Once again, Physical need, market timing uh, is how that sometimes manifests. And the second thing is the infrastructure and data. So I will make the case that data is one of the key inputs and one of the key substrates here that the cells are growing on. Everything that a tool was showing yesterday where he would say, well, if you found a problem X, just go search for problem X amongst all of the sequence genes. And he pulled up a site that's maintained by the Library of Medicine. 
The infrastructure is owned by the federal government, the cataloging is owned by the federal government, and a lot of the research is paid for by the federal government. So providing that key substrate is something that we do all the time. So just as a refresher, and because I was not aware of all of this um, in my pre-federal government days, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how big the government is in healthcare. So the federal government is the largest payer in the world, the US federal government, apologies to anyone who's from another country, is the largest payer in the world. It pays for approximately 30% of all the healthcare expenditures in the US. Um, and increasingly, it is interested in paying in those, for those through value-based payments. It also provides direct care for over 20 million patients. So that includes the VA, that includes the DOD. The DOD actually owns their own hospitals. That includes the Indian Health Service, and that includes people in our federal prisons. Um, we spend over $20 billion on healthcare IT in the traditional sense. We also spend over $30 billion in health research. We have the FDA, which regulates a lot of the things that you guys are working on, um, and we have the CDC. We you know, provide re regulations around what types of lab results can come back, um, and also you know, are in charge of things like HIPAA. So I think this is, it's easy to forget. This is a tremendous substrate. This is all data that can be available. This is all data that can be used. It's in the public. Um, but it's also an incredible opportunity to move markets. This is more than a third of the entire US healthcare market is defined by what the federal government chooses to do uh, in a lot of different ways. And that can either be freaky or it can be a tremendous opportunity to engage more. So one of the things that we're very focused on is government modernization as an accelerant to help you guys grow the types of businesses that you want. And I've outlined a lot of the different ways that the government um, that the government is engaged with the healthcare system. As you guys all know, right, the, one of the key challenges, ha, have any of you tried to do business with the government in the past? <laughs> have any of you filled out your taxes online? Or, um, so it can be incredibly challenging. Sometimes the technology is not where it needs to be in order to move quickly. And all of us are focused very much on how do we um, build our technology so that we can iterate quickly, so that we can be responsive, so that we can be user-centered, um, so that we can spend less money to buy more infrastructure or more changes. And so one of the things that we've been working on in the government is making each of those things possible. We have developed a playbook. We are in the process of implementing it across agencies. And we are quite focused on how do you make the services more responsive? How do we start to bring best practices from industry in terms of how to design the technology, in terms of how to do user interaction design, in terms of procurement? OK, we are innovating within procurement. This post on the left is, we did a pilot around micro-purchasing agreements, and we managed to buy a significant piece of software for a dollar that was open source because we ran a reverse auction, and people were willing to build it anyways. So we are innovating and working to make all of the things that, we've, that I've been talking about more responsive and more able to sort of impedance match with the types of organizations that you guys are engaged in so that over time we can start to internalize more technology and, uh, and work more closely with organizations such as your own and, and change things quickly. And then finally, I wanted to talk about government as a catalyst and government as a market mover. Um, these are a few examples of places that we are doing incredibly exciting things that I think would be of interest to all of you, and I can talk more or less about some of them. But we'll start off by talking about the open data policy. Uh, I think many of you are probably familiar with it. This administration made an executive order, has declared that uh, all the federal government's data should be open. It, is in, it should be in the public domain. And we've you know, done a bunch of work here. Here you can see a couple cool things. Uh, we have the, the digital analytics dashboard, which shows across all the federal websites where the traffic is. Um, very interesting to see during tax season how it spikes. Uh, we also have... Um, requirements around all the federally funded research at NIH to make the data from research that's been federally funded open over time. They need to have a plan for how they're going to bring that data online. Um, we are working with agencies from Commerce, uh, from NASA, from NOAA, um, 
but also the health agencies to bring data online and make it possible. And I, I think this is pretty exciting to this group because that data has been the substrate that so much of the innovation that we have been talking about um, is based on. Uh, Another exciting uh, place where government can be uh, a motive force is, um, so the president declared last year uh, the pre his precision medicine initiative. And I, I don't know, have you guys heard much about it? Have people worked on it? Lots of hands. Um, so the precision medicine initiative is a certain amount of money um, for a bunch of agencies to work on things. And I think what this talks about, it, what, I'm, what I would like to tell you about is how, as a foundation for doing science, um, there are a number of changes across the ecosystem that can help accelerate the type of work that a lot of you are focused on. So it's not just one science project that anyone is financing. It's not just um, you know, a specific cohort. We're really doing work in privacy. So the privacy principles were actually released yesterday, but... <clears throat> the work in privacy to help develop a core set of privacy principles, and also to think about, through um, new guidance around HIPAA, what, what the role of patient privacy needs to be and how we can fulfill that in a world that is technology-enabled. So it's really updating regulations and expectations in the marketplace, which is both you know, foundational but also a motive force for, for what expectations are from organizations. Um, we're working on patient choice, which is also closely tied into HIPAA, so patients should have control of their own data. And that also comes with you know, work by the Office of Civil Rights at uh, Health and Human Services. Um, there's new guidance coming out around security principles for healthcare. A lot of what we think of as security in healthcare is outdated, is from another era of how we thought about technology and infrastructure. And so we're currently in the process of revisiting that and building a set of security principles that can help to be guiding principles across many of your organizations as well as the institutional uh, researchers that you work with. Um, new rules around data access and how um, we build the frameworks for data, the standards around how data can be managed so that more different groups can find it useful. Um, more modern regulations. So. 21st Century Cures came out, there's now a bill in the Senate to think about how we should use health data to help us improve our healthcare system. And then finally, data standards around how we want to manage and transmit data uh, and encode it so that you know, a lot of the projects that you guys work on, data that comes off a machine is easy, data in an EMR right now is hard, how can we start to move the ball forward on that? So, We've built a foundation, and then we're also making investments in actual technologies and data sets that sit on top of that foundation. So NIH is building a cohort that will be in good part driven by patient donated data. Uh, MVP is a project at the VA where they've already enrolled 400,000 veterans and collected biospecimens from them uh, in order to do both genomic and longitudinal research. Uh, NCI has a new project called Match, which is quite exciting. And then the last set of things I wanted to talk about uh, very briefly, although I think it's incredibly important, is how the incentives can help move all of the um, programs that you guys are working on. So the federal government, as I've mentioned, is the purchaser, not just the federal government, some combination of the U.S. government is the purchaser of over half of the healthcare, uh, covers over half of Americans. Um, and we have been driving the move towards value-based care, which I think is one of the fundamental things that will help to make technologies that you guys are working on responsive uh, and procurable in the way that you guys want. So one common complaint that I had when I was in healthcare, when I was a healthcare entrepreneur, is that it's not a rational market. It isn't driven by necessarily what works, it's driven by what payers demand. And we have been moving, the federal, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, have determined that 30% of, so they have a, a, a center for innovation that has demonstrated a whole array of payment models um, which help drive down costs, which help improve quality, and they are moving towards 30% of patients in value-based purchasing agreements in the next 
two years and 50% of patients in the next four. So we are significantly moving the market to a more rational marketplace. Um, there are exciting programs that they're putting out, and, and I'll wrap up here, but there are exciting programs that they're putting out in terms of access to CMS data. Um, the Qualified Entity Program has been modified, and the ability to get access to large data sets from CMS in terms of claims, outcomes, treatment, um, is forthcoming in the next year. Uh, MACRA is a new bill that was just passed to help fix some of the payment rates, and it's open for comment. So it contains a whole bunch of, tech, of, uh, of language about the incentives that we should be paying for using technology meaningfully, uh, and there are tremendous opportunities for us both to influence the way that gets written and also for us to respond once it comes out, um, because it's going to focus us much more on outcomes, it's going to focus us much more on meaningful use of technology in the true sense of the word, um, and it's going to focus us all on alternative payment models that are value-based. So that's my conversation. Uh, I wanted to tell you about a bunch of things. I'm here for a little while longer, but uh, please join us in helping to build a more awesome uh, government and healthcare system for all of you, and also to uh, provide the substrate and technology to enable the things that you're working on. Thank you.